We have an exciting panel for you here this morning. We have, I'm starting in different order now, Philip Lim of Philip Lim, the designer of 3.1 Philip Lim, who's an advocate of the use of natural fibers such as merino wool, and who kindly dressed me today. It's looking good, right? We're, I, I know black, black and white and neutral tones are very fashion, but I think we just gotta go for color right now, right? We need color in our lives. And then we have Amber Valletta, who's a leading force in sustainable fashion. And we have Barack, do I say Barack or Barack? Barack Kakmak, Dean of the School of Fashion at Parsons. And he's teaching students to think of sustainability in all realms of design and production, which is great news. We gotta start at the grassroots, right? So we're gonna just talk a bit, it's gonna be kind of conversational. I'm gonna ask them a bit about this and that, and then we're gonna just chat. And we'll then ask question, take questions from you all. Does that sound okay? So we start thinking. And I'm going to start with Philip, way down at the end. <laughs> Sorry, dear. Yeah. Um, okay. So you're known as one of the top designers who's vocal about making conscious, a conscious effort to embrace sustainability, like we just got to change it up, right? And I just want to know why you chose this path, when, and how is it going so far? Yeah. Um. I, I didn't realize I chose this path. I just started to speak about it. I started to um, uh, come out of the shame of not uh, thinking to be sustainable, you have to be perfect. I just come out to realize, like, listen, without ever um, being explicit about it, nothing can ever change. And realizing that I have, I'm the creator of what of my fate, but I also, I also am the impactor. And I've come to this, this point in my life where a lot of self-reflection and coming with the idea of, I'm so lucky I get to do what I do, which is what I love to do, and I get to share this world with all of you guys. It's a really beautiful planet. And how do we balance doing what we love to do, but also making sure that we protect and keep beautiful the home that we all share and so it's come to that point point. and you know for me I sit here representing not a specialist I could not quote anything I could not give you percentages all I can I all I can represent is more entrepreneurial transformation meaning like conversion from the inside outwards um, I deal with this every single day I'm in conflict every single day um, but I realize that it's all about balance and it's all about Sustainability to me is about the sustainable balance. Um, internally, we call it the three one sustainable balance because it's about how we start right so that we don't have to, we have to correct less and so that we actually impact less. Mm. So that's where I am. Exactly. And so how have you brought this into your collection? Oh, like what are yeah. some of the examples? I'm wearing Thank wool, <laughs> wool mark, Thank you. merino wool, right? Yeah, um, I am a, nature lover you know i've always uh, my whole process of, it, of even coming to this industry has been quite a natural path i i grew up in orange county uh california and so i was never the around OC. The, the, the real oc i i grew up uh not around fashion very simple uh suburban childhood upbringing but in me i had to create and when i began uh working in fashion i didn't have resources and i would just was compelled to use creativity to, um, to put out possibilities. And along my journey, you know, some successes, some fails, um, some ups, some downs, and more resources, I realized I was drowning in shit, basically. Drowning in shit, and I w it was getting confusing. I was losing my own message as a person, but also as a person that is in charge of a brand. And so I realized, like, let's reboot. and and take humble, small steps, meaning like how we start, maybe we start more natural. And if we, if we cannot be fully natural, how, is it, um, uh, how do you break it apart and be impactful? So as a designer and um, um, uh, creative director of a self-owned brand, it's about looking at the process of how a garment is made and delivered. I can start with, for example, I, we started with thinking about fibers we use, how to bring back more natural fibers to create more natural textiles. We think about um, design, who is it for, 
Is it, does it have a purpose? Does it have add value? We think about um, uh, merchandising. Um, how do we not just throw it out there? How do we take uh, experience? How do we take a moment to make more educated guesses so that you're not wasteful? Um, how do we think about um, production and who we use, who, what factors we work with? Um, how do we package? How do we really scrutinize packaging and kind of going through and like, oh, what's the least of the evils? How do you substitute? How do you investigate and in, um, uh, um, uh, time? We think about how do you now, the last part is how do you communicate this explicitly? How do you not be afraid to say, I'm trying, you know? And, um, and since working with the Walmart, uh, I think we started 2018, 2019, fall 2019, the collection that you're wearing now. Um, I, I was looking at the fabrics and I was like, oh, okay, so now charting everything, like 8% is of the fabric groups are, have a sustain, sustainable component or it's very natural. And I'm very proud up to uh, this collection now, spring, what year are we in? It's 2020. 2020. <laughs> We're up to 40%. Fantastic. So it's really just small entrepreneurial um, start with yourself uh, steps that you adjust to hopefully shift to a bigger way of living. It's, and it's the small steps that really do make a difference. Yeah. As I learned while working on this book I've just published, Fashionopolis, that if we all just do little bits, it already has a huge impact. We don't 100%. have to change the whole model all at once. Yeah. But you know, if you can go from 10% to 20% to 40% to 60%, then in five years, boom, you're, you, yeah. you got it. As human beings, we're motivated by, uh, by, um, uh, by progress. So it's like small changes, tangible changes that we can see it really motivates us to take it to the next step. And makes us feel better about what yeah. we're doing too, yeah. right? Um, now, some of the materials, you've, you work with Woolmark, are there any other materials that, are, that you've changed? Yeah, yes, um, like for example, um, polyesters. Dirty word, which right? is which is basically plastic. Basically plastic. It's um, made of petroleum. Exactly, and I live in this world a quite modern world. I'm a quite modern person, and I can't avoid that. So what I can do is go in and like uh, uh, with my teams and like, okay, this polyester. What's the composition of this? Can we use second generation? Can we can we use um, instead of first generation? Can we use uh, while we're doing that? Can we also look for uh, new technology that's biodegradable? You know what I mean? Anything that we can actually um, pay attention to the big picture, but adjust with small steps right. to lessen the impact. Because as we live, as we all live here, as we all uh, got here on foot, in car, on planes, it's impactful. Yeah. We can't avoid that. You, you cannot stop living either. Because you know the way we live, hopefully, the goal is to live a more beautiful life for the future exactly. for our planet. Exactly. Now, Amber, um, you've become very involved with the sustainability movement you know, you're a model, and then you've gone into this sort of action area in your life. How did you get into this, and why? Well, I, um, I grew up in Oklahoma around nature. My mom was an activist, so I saw someone who fought for her community. Um, she stopped, helped stop a nuclear power plant from being built on Native American land. And so seeing that firsthand and then kind of connecting my values and then hearing about all the environmental stuff, obviously in my early years of modeling because President Clinton and Al Gore was speaking about it so much, I started kind of seeing the discrepancies between what I was doing and, and uh, what was happening in the world. And so um, I started becoming an advocate for the environment um, when I moved to California, I think when I was about 25 or 26. And where was this, in Los Angeles? Yes, and I started working with NRDC, and, um, and then, you know, kept going and still couldn't quite understand how I could make the connection with fashion, and I was in, also in another industry. Sorry, everyone, that's my I hear phone. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, did a cricket just Sam? walk in? Sam, <laughs> yeah, I, I, I set that up on purpose. Um, nature, we needed we, some we needed nature. Some nature. Um, and so I, when I decided to kind of match my values with, with what I was doing for a living, 
I literally sat down with my business partner. Well, first I talked to Anna Winter and asked her, what do I do? And what did she say? She said, you need to talk to like a handful of people. She was very specific who. And I did all of those things except one person. And, um, and I sat down, and she said, take about a year to really be entrepreneurial and research and think about and learn what, you, what it is you want to do exactly and how to do it and make connections and educate yourself. So that's what I did. Cool. And when I started, I sat down with my business partner, and who's also my producing partner, and we laid out our core values just as people and as a business. What, what would we want to do? And I had an aha moment that was, we, first I was thinking of developing a beauty brand that was natural, then I was thinking maybe clothes. And, um, but I had this aha moment that was like, I just can't start making more stuff. Um, I already, my job is to sell you stuff and I just can't be another seller of stuff unless it's next level. And so what I did was I started looking out around and seeing, and this is like in 2011 or 12, are there any sustainable designers? Is anybody selling sustainable fashion or responsibly made fashion and accessories? And we found some. And I went out and looked for a partner and started Master and Muse, an online store for responsibly made fashion to prove that you could have style and substance. And there, at that time, there we talked to investors. They thought we were nuts. We That's talked. That's something I encountered while working on my book. Everybody who came up with these cool, sustainable ideas, usually women, were told they were crazy. Yeah, people. But they for, they they went forward and did it anyway. We and did. We charged ahead. I mean, I bootstrapped my business, and then I found a partner with Ukes, and and thank God for them because they really did help me prove the point that this was a, a viable business. And, and now it's part of Ukes, correct? It, it was. And then in 2000, the end of 2015, the last quarter, um, things changed for them. And so Master and Muse right now is not an active platform. We are kind of thinking about the next ideation of that and what will Master and Muse be. And uh, that's a whole other conversation. But I just know that I can't, I already sell stuff, which is a personal battle I have, and that's why I'm so actively trying to get people in the industry to change and consumers to change. And I'm going to kind of take it up in <laughs> another level in the next year. But, um, you know, I, I'm insistent on not creating something that isn't revolutionary and, and isn't circular. And circular. Now, if I do it myself. You talked about your producer. That means you make documentaries, right? Yes. Um, my partner and I, Amy Johnson, have a, have a production company called A Squared. And um, we've produced uh, a series for Lexus Studio, L Studio, called Driving Fashion Forward. That came out, I think, four years ago, right around the launch of Master and Muse. And... Um, then we did another one last year with the Sierra Club called Reinventing Power that's basically all about new re, um, renewable energies here in America and that so many companies and so many states and so many people are actually changing the way they look at, at the power that we use. Um, and then we're working on a new doc. It's more of a short called The Changing Room. And this one I'm really excited about. This is, a, this is for the consumer people and the industry. It's a short to educate on a very high level uh, how we're impacting the environment and the social issues within the fashion industry. And what we can do. And what we can do about it. And what we how can do we about can it. change. Exactly. Now, Barack, you, at, at Pars you came from co the corporate world. Yes. So you've, you've been on both sides now. Um, Works. You were at Caring. What, what did you do when you were at Caring to help improve their sustainability record? Because they do have one of the better ones on the corporate level in fashion. I mean, I've been in, in this space for close to 20 years now. And I started with Gap Inc. in San Francisco, uh, <laughs> continued with Caring, and then Swarovski, and uh, in between worked with a lot of other brands at mass market and luxury level from H&M all the way to LVMH and others. Right. And um, being in the system, I recognize all of the challenges of how they operate. And the main 
core issue was the business model. And the business model. <laughs> and, uh, and that led me to really take the job that I'm in. Uh, but in my role in the industry, including caring, it was always around looking at what systems we can put in place to reduce our impact, just like Philip is saying. But part of it is also looking at new ways of doing things. Right. And, and, and sort of changing the system from, the ver from day one with new, from day one. From and new uh, folks, starting new businesses. Absolutely. I mean, uh, just reflecting on what I'm hearing here, it was interesting to also see how much uh, value-driven both Amber and Philip has been. And that's exactly what we are trying to do today with education. Because if you're not starting uh, with the core values you have in you when you have control over your business, right. Uh, when you become a public company and you're dependent on other shareholders' interests, you lose control over how do you reflect those values into you're your muscled. day operations. You're muscled into sacrificing your integrity. That's it. Basically. Exactly. That's it. So what were some of the things that you've come up with that, that you try to teach young people so that they, they do manage to subvert the system? I mean, uh, being <laughs> being in the in the industry for a long time, yeah. we're all rebels here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it is the truth, so no need to hide from it. And and the reality is, being in the system and recognizing both the values and the passion of the designers, but also in a big system, how limited they are in being able to change things. It was important to start with this conversation when they're just coming into school so that they understand their core values, but also encourage them to build their concepts around those things that they care about. And we ask these basic questions when they're going into, especially in their thesis year, right. what do you care about and how do you build a system around that? So are you telling, helping them source more sustainable fabrics? Yeah. Are they very keen and aware about the problems of human rights yeah. and um, offshoring and outsourcing yeah. and subcontracting and paying people pennies to make clothes and they're avoiding that? Are they doing direct to consumer? Sure. What are some of the things you I see mean, happening coming yeah, from your kids? For sure. I mean, these are even the 101s because the way we are trying to reframe it is to say that fashion has a voice. It's an emotional sector. It connects with people in a different way. First and foremost, how do we look at, we highlight the challenges of the existing fashion system. That's everything from material sourcing, production, logistics, impact on human and the environment. And we teach them how to be part of that system, but also think differently about it. Yeah. Uh, but beyond that, also, how do you use your voice and values to bring change to the world through the lens of fashion and not necessarily being the typical fashion brand right. and be an activist with it? So we are seeing these ideas come through. And one of the ways we try to do that is try to change the incentives we have for the students. Right. So we used to... You mean it's not just about making money? It cannot be just about making <laughs> money, right? So uh, ideally, it's a win-win, and you're making money as, as you're building something new. So we're all a little bit Marxist. <laughs> <laughs> Which we're going to make sexy again. <laughs> that, that might be a challenge, but... <laughs> well, we have Amber on our side, yeah. so it'll work. <laughs> now, um, we're going to... I want to ask you, like, I'm going to put you on the spot here. What are you wearing today? I'm wearing... Philip Lim. Yo, you got the easy one. And, and I know that it's all sustainable and rightly made because he told me so. <laughs> um, and it's with Woolmark and Merino Wool, and it's, which is fantastic, from Australia. But tell me what you're wearing today. I'm wearing Merino Wool. <laughs> um, same, uh, my brand, 3-1 Philip Lim. Um, you know... And we're not hot. It breathes. We're no, not sweltering here under these spots. The, you know, in, in, the, in the studio, um, when I was suggesting wool all year round, people were like, what? You know what I mean? Because the traditional model is like, it's wool, cotton, wool, cotton, and whatnot. I'm like, no, but let's go back and understand what wool is, basically. Wool is uh, Mother Nature's perfect fiber. Think about the, uh, the sheep that have to, um, uh, that are outdoors year round, and they look really cute and beautiful, actually. <laughs> and you want to snuggle with them. Don't we just want to always pet lambs? Yeah, yeah. And, um, you know, going back to thinking about what is natural, it's created for us already. And how do we activate that? And how do we change the marketing of it? How do we change perception um, from a youth level of, of not, thinking in for, not thinking about it as seasonal? thinking about season less, and it's not for your parents. It's actually kind of make it cool. So what I'm wearing is like my idea of a suit, a wool suit. 
you know, with kicks, with um, in in colors that are really beautiful and kind of like uh, connected to nature, nature's nuancing of colors. So, in that aspect, I get to design um, what I desire exactly. using nature. And you know, it's interesting. When I was working on this book, I spent a lot of time with Stella McCartney, who also uses sustainable everything she can possible. And one of the things she talked about was wool, and she sources her wool from New Zealand where you know they have 70 million sheep and 3 million people <laughs> and and the, and you know this is not industrial farming where they're cramming all these sheep into you know tight quarters and and f ramming down food and they're miserable and and she said you know the quality of the wool is so much more superior that that the 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 stressed sheep it, it reflects in their wool, which makes sense. I mean, if you think about your life when you're stressed, your hair gets brittle and starts breaking, right? Or falls out. Well, the same with sheep. And their, their wool gets tighter and, and more fragile and brittle and r rougher. And she said, happy sheep make better wool. Sure. And it was as simple as that. When I thought that, I heard that, I was like, of course, of course. Now, how have you, I mean, you're a designer, so you could do this anyway, but how have you incorporated this into your wardrobe, this sustainability idea? How, how is your wardrobe at home, in your closet, how has your closet changed? I haven't really bought anything. Um, I, well, you don't have to. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I get to make it. Um, I think about also... Um, editing out my closet, because I think that, again, buried in shit, you know, the shit that we Marie look Kondo? back. Marie Yeah, exactly. But what, do you, but what do you do with it? I actually um, send an email around the office and pass it around. Cool. Yeah, I pass around and someone else has a, a use Philip for Blim it. A Philip Blim swap party. Don't we want to oh, be on that email yeah, chain? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We do this thing. Um, we start doing this thing in management meetings, and you guys should try it, too. It's kind of amazing. Um, it's like you start the meeting with give and get. So you announce nice. what you'd love to, what you could give and what you'd love to receive. Oh. And, and one of the most powerful things is when you're vulnerable. Asking for help, uh, ask, saying that you don't know is also first steps to like your sustainable way. So what we do is like people are like, oh, like for example, I'm, I did, um, oh, I have these extra ceramic potteries that I would love to find a home for because they're so beautiful. Someone made them, but they don't, fit right now, so who can enjoy them next? And then the email goes around, and then someone says, me, 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 I just moved into this, and they get to enjoy. Perfect. Like with clothes at the same time. Love that. Yeah. Now, Amber, what are you wearing today? I see some great jeans. Uh, yes, these are vintage Levi's that are repurposed by Redone. And cool. um, this T-shirt is by Redone that's made in LA. This is a vintage Chanel jacket that's Gosh, probably 20 years old. It's really good. Um, and That's then, the beauty of Chanel. You can wear it for 20 years or longer. Yes. And then some classic boots by Saint Laurent that I'll have for 20 years. Right. Okay. And how has your wardrobe changed? Wow. Um, Since my, you took this on in 2012. Well, what's scary is that I have things from 25 years ago, or not so scary. Right? They say the 90s are back in, <laughs> in fashion. I'm like, I'm still wearing the 90s. I still, yeah. <laughs> I, I've got a lot of vintage because I, I love vintage and always have. Um, so I have a lot of vintage. Um, I don't buy very much. I'm, I'm not a big consumer of, of things in general. Um, and clothes, I'm just very particular because I know the impact. So I can't, I just can't buy frivol frivolously anymore. I can't just like go in and just... Uh, drop money and not pay attention e wherever it is, whether it's somewhere like, you know, a, a less expensive store or or a more luxury store. I'm I'm very conscientious now and right. Um, and I try to wear things. I reuse. I repurpose. I make a lot of, you know, we have a lot of rags. Or I cut. I change hemlines. I cut arms off. Change it up. If I don't like the way it looks, it doesn't seem as modern. And now you can take it over to Philip, and he'll put it in an email and send it around yes, the office. Yes, well, but, <laughs> but you know, the the end of life of a of a garment is is just as important as the beginning of its life, and I think that is a, a huge part of this conversation. That um, 
you know, it's really not about sustainability anymore. It's about circularity. Circularity. And business, all business has to move in that direction, that we can't keep extrapolating more raw materials and more resources from the planet. We have to find ways to use what we have and just stay in a, in a pattern of circular design. Exactly. And, you know, put back in and reuse it. And and that's just the way it, it's yeah. it's got to got to go. So I, I highlight a lot of I those I try companies. to do that at home with my own stuff. And I highlight those some of those companies the the cool startups that are happening in the book like oh, Ev yeah. That's like Evernew who's taking t-shirts and breaking them down to their molecular base and then re reconstituting them into cotton yarn or worn again in London it's managing to separate collie pot and blends, which was a big problem for a long time. Like those were the clothes that wound up in landfill because nobody could figure out how to divorce polyester from cotton. They were blended and that was that. And then it wouldn't biodegrade because because polyester doesn't biodegrade, it's plastic. So this woman and her and a scientist from Cambridge have managed to figure out how to take both, separate them, and then take them back to their molecular level and regenerate them over and over and over again. Not just once or twice, but over and over and over again. So we basically don't have to you know, drill for more oil to make more polyester. We can just use the polyester we have out there. And we can dial back the growing of cotton to its natural level. Right now, it's a bit like, you know how you hear these horror stories of ag industrial farming feeding cows hormones to get four times as much milk out of one cow? Well, we do the same with cotton, and now we can dial that back. You know, we don't need the GMO cotton. We can just use organic and get one what the one amount we're supposed to get out of a field, not four times we get out of a field, and causing erosion and using too much water and all the rest of it through these innovations and circularity, which is just the future. Don't ever throw away clothes. There is a solution. Now, Barack. <laughs> Question, I guess. <laughs> what are you wearing, my friend? I am wearing um, a suit I got actually tailor-made when I was in Shanghai, out of all places. It's a fabric coming from Italy and uh, using linen blend with wool. Linen, one of the most sustainable fabrics out there. I know it's a nightmare to keep wrinkle-free, but you just yeah. have to embrace the wrinkle. Absolutely. Well, I, I mean, <laughs> if it's blended in the right way, it performs better, but... Uh, but it uses the least amount of water, absolutely. and it and it grows in any kind of earth. It's yeah. It does, It loves poor earth. It's yeah. great. Flax is a good, good, good yeah. material. But when you're able to buy it as a fabric, you can ask also the country of origin for the mill and where it was woven, the blends. It gives you much more control over what uh, you're putting on your body and overall I guess my journey in the system has been for so long that my behavior has always been shaped by one of the companies I work with because you want to represent the company you work for uh, so it was more than anything uh, putting that hat as I need to represent the brand and buying products from them but after a while, recognizing that I actually don't need more and being able to just use what you have. Use what you and, have. And, and to a point where... Cherish you, it. Yeah, exactly. To a point where you don't actually need to get anything anymore other than some maybe vintage pieces. Uh, but reflecting on especially what Amber was saying, we are at a point where we have a company like Real Real with a valuation of $1 billion that's based on just... Second and clothing. So clearly the tides are turning. One of the crazy interest. figures that I heard, well, not crazy, but right now apparently vintage clothing makes up on average 6% of a woman's wardrobe. And within a few years it's going to be 13%. It's going to double in like a blink because there's just so much clothing out there that we got to, that is in circulation. And how has your wardrobe changed then? You're not buying. Not necessarily. I mean, it's easier to be a man, I must admit. But uh, <laughs> uh, but what what really changes my mindset because uh, what I'm wearing is all about uh, making sure that it fits my lifestyle and what I want to do, rather than what people perceive as the right thing to wear. Right. Uh, so if you know what you care about and align everything in your wardrobe with that, you know that that's good enough. Great. Mine mine has changed in that. I mean, I've always been one of those. My my 19 year old calls me a hoarder. I'm like, I'm not a hoarder. I just don't like throwing things out. It's not the same thing, right? So she found my vintage jeans from the 1980s stuffed back in the back of the closet. I, they had just been sitting on a shelf and got pushed back, and they were sitting there, sort of biding their time. She pulled them out. I had, these were original 501 Levi's 
that were, you know, shrink to fit, you know, that took six months to break in well enough that you could sit down in them, that, you know, like gave you, sh you know, rashes on your knees the first three months, and then eventually started cracking in all the right places. And to make it even better, I got out my mom's sewing machine and tailored them so that, you know, because I bought the men's ones and then pulled them in because I had no hips. And so she pulled them out and they're like, and she said, oh, these are really good. And I was like, you see, you see? And she called them boyfriend jeans. And I'm like, well, okay. They're really mom jeans, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> and she's been wearing them. And of course, everybody thinks that they look fantastic. And they're worn out in the right places through love. And just, you know, hard wear. Not because somebody in Vietnam without a mask in a 100-degree factory, like I saw firsthand, was drilling them with this thing that sounds like a dentist drill all day long with a fan blowing all the dust around for them to inhale. No, I just wore them. So, and then I kept them. And it's not that they took up a lot of space. They were in the back of the closet, so there they were. But the other thing I've started doing since I started working on the book is I started renting clothes. Now, I know people are down on Rent the Runway because it has the largest dry cleaning facility in the world. And we know that dry cleaning is not necessarily the cleanest thing we'd have around. but. Two different things. First, I rent from a place in Paris where they use a green cleaning system and they deliver by bicycle. So that's already like a few good, and the guy who delivers on the bicycle, you like opening your door to him. And, he, <laughs> and he's holding your dress and goes, I have your dress for you tonight. And you go like, God, you're like the male version of the, of the fairy godmother in Cinderella. I love you. And then, um, and then also, a friend of mine just over dinner this week told me she's from Jamaica, and they didn't have dry cleaning where she, when she was growing up there. I mean, they did, but you know, a lot around the corner. And, um, and so what they used to do in Jamaica is they just put their clothes out in the sun. And she said, the sun will clean your clothes for you. You just put it out on the line, and it will come, you know, a good wool suit, and it will not smell. It will, I mean, if you have a stain on it, that's a different thing. But, you know, just sort of everyday kind of you want to get it clean again. She said, put it out in the sun. It will come back smelling like the sun, which I thought was lovely. So I've been renting, and I rented when I had to go to the Cannes Film Festival and needed a new gown. And I was like, I don't need a new gown. I just need a great look for this evening. And I kind of like glammed up in a way that I wouldn't have if I had bought, because I'd be like, oh, but where else am I going to wear this? I can't wear this to a family wedding. That would be too much. And how many times am I going to walk a red carpet? So I rented like, you know, a Hollywood glamour red carpet and it was fun and fantastic, felt very Cinderella. And then returned it the next day and I could afford it because it was a tenth of the price of retail. I do the same for conferences. I didn't today because Philip kindly said, pick something out, so I did. But for conferences, especially sustainability ones like Copenhagen, I rented my wardrobe and took it with me and and then when I was done, I sent it back, and I looked great, and I had a new snappy suit. And all I had to pack that was my own was, you know, lingerie shoes and some workout clothes, not that I ever had time to work out. So, um, you know, I feel like there's ways that we can change it up and change it up in a nice way. I'm not going to contribute hugely to the rental business and therefore dry cleaning, but when it's a special occasion, why am I going to go out and buy something I'm going to wear three times in the next five years? or maybe never again, and it's sitting there in the closet, and every time you open your closet, you go, God, I should wear that again somewhere, but where? Rent. Okay, so, done with my little speech. Um, uh, sustainable fashion, let's just like talk this, bat this around. Sustainable fashion can be pricey. I kind of think of it like the organic food movement from 15, 20 years ago. So how do we make it more democratic and more affordable like organic food? Or do we just wait until it becomes more? Of, I mean, I, that's the question I keep getting asked on this book tour is what about the folks, students, young people, you know, middle class or whatever who want to have a new dress to go to a wedding or a party or a Friday night out and don't have a lot of disposable income? What do we do for them? Barack and I were talking about that a little bit before this started, and I mean, there's there's a, there's quite a few different paths. There's renting, like there's I did. There's renting. There's vintage. There's borrowing. There is, um, you know, buying something. Swapping. There's swapping. There's buying something that you know you will keep 
for, like I said, for 25 years and maybe you adjust the sleeves. There's also, as consumers who maybe can't afford luxury fashion, we must demand that all these companies that are making clothes at a, at a lower cost do better by all of us. And yes, it's all about margins and their profits and all of that, but I question if you make that much stuff and you can't sell it, you're in loss of profit. So if we ask them to make less, but still affordable and sustainably, then we can change the system. Because we are, there is no way that everybody can afford, you know, high designer piece that they keep forever. But they can afford things that are at, at a lower cost. But we can also change our mindset as consumers and how we dispose of something and how long we keep it. Just because it's cheap doesn't mean you get to throw it away. Clothes don't go in the trash. Clothes don't go in the trash. And that also is government's responsibility to create more recycling bins for clothes specifically. Our QRL codes need to be very clear about where it can be recycled, how it can be recycled, and sent to these new. I mean, it's a whole, the whole system has to just become 21st century. We're still operating in a 20th the 19th cent century. Yeah. And so that also means government subsidies need to go for organic. And I mean, there's. This is a massively big conversation, but... I just wrote a whole book on it. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, you know, I mean, that, in my opinion, it's buying less, buying smarter, buying better, demand your brands, do better, and ask them to, to label it. It doesn't have to be their, their marketing point, but I'd like to know when I go, I didn't even know, and I'm in this, you know, field of sustainability, and... I just learned recently that like five brands of jeans that I look, liked from afar actually buy from a mill that I know is completely sustainable. But I didn't know that because they don't label it. They don't label it. We need, we need more transparency for we sure. We need more transparency. And Absolutely. tracing, being able to trace of the supply chain. Absolutely. And some companies do put it on their website, but it takes work to get that. But I, also I mean, in the per in the in the in the, the George Jetson dream world, we'll be able to take our phone, scan that QR code on the on the and it'll just spell out on our phone where the cotton came from where it was milled where it was dyed what it was dyed but blockchain we're we're still a bit off on that yeah blockchain should be but maybe, maybe i can also mention on the business side yes, where please. the cost comes from yes it's really around the materials for a designer or a brand that's trying to create it in a more sustainable way most of the time and sometimes also depend on the country of production labor. and labor uh, but the fabric is 50% of the cost anyway, so in most of the cases. And uh, the challenge is for more than anyone, fast fashion. For, because for them, it's about the small margins they have, and even a small play in the cost of fabric has a big impact on their margins. Where I have an issue is when luxury actually doesn't pay attention because they choose to use their large margins to go into marketing versus a more sustainable material. So it's not I okay I remember to, Stella yeah. saying, yeah. you know, how much do we put out really? There's no reason why we aren't all using organic cotton. 100%. 100%. I mean, organic, fair, trade, recycled. Is, is it okay for a luxury brand to do a 100% version polyester suit? There are brands that are doing it. <laughs> there are brands that are using a lot of cotton that's just conventional. Uh, so we Conventional need to cotton is one of the dirtiest things out there. You'll see progress soon, really soon, because of all of, you know, between the UN sustainability goals, uh, there's the new one with the G7. Yeah, there's, packed, yeah. yeah. so there's, the, I think you're going to see some pretty big shifts in the industry, hopefully in the next five years, don't you think? I agree. Yeah. They're going to be systematic. They're going to be huge. Cool. I think we're going to start taking some questions. Oh, uh, one thing I wanted to quickly point out, as Amber said, and it's not sustainable even always on an economic level, you know, Forever 21 is teetering on bankruptcy. And they source in sweatshops in LA. They're not even sourcing on sweatshops overseas. So it shows that this model actually doesn't necessarily work. The big volume, low cost, pay our workers nothing model. You can still go bankrupt. So let's take some questions. Yes. Yeah, that's another way we're going to change it up. We're just going to keep making a lot of noise. Sorry, 
Thank you. Hello. Uh, good morning. Um, do you send anyone from your team out to the out of the country to wherever you're sourcing your animal products, the wool? Does someone check in on these locations to make sure that they are, you know, treating the animals compassionately? Um, I guess it's a question for you, Philip. Um, the size of my company, it's like all hands on deck, and we don't have. Um, I try to I try to spend my profits on. Um, uh, human beings, uh, fair living wage. So we don't have extra money to um, have this army. And if I could, if I were in a bigger company, this is something I would do. But what what we try to do is we work um, with our factories and our mills that we've been working with, with since day one. Since day one, they're usually certified or we watch and we grow together. For example, um, we work with two main factories when we produce ready to wear. And one, the fact, one of the Where factories, um, Shantou and um, um, Shenzhen. And one of the factories that uh, made Dana's outfit today, um, we started uh, 2005 and 2006 we engaged them. They had 40 employees and then we worked together to grow into 800. And we know how they work, they know how we work. It's quite a close relationship and if something steps out of balance, we know right away. So it's really about trying to, for, I'm just speaking from um, my own personal point of view, because I never worked in a big company before. Yes. Yes, Stel McCartney has a, somebody in charge, a chief of sustainability, and she goes out. She's the one who knows that the sheep are happy. And um, in New Zealand, and she goes to the cotton farms in Egypt and sees the women, you know, spinning the cotton and picking the cotton, but also the farmers who are growing it organically in the Nile River Delta. And you know, she, Claire's on the road all the time checking on these things and finding new places. And they work with places, they are also NGOs like Canopy. And a lot of brands will work with the, this Canadian NGO to make sure that the rayon business stays clean and pressure the rayon business to get cleaner because rayon is made of tree pulp. Yeah. And there was and much of the rayon business was farming these trees from an endangered forest in Indonesia in the poor old Amazon. Yeah. And um, and they pressured them to stop doing that. They also do things like they pressured it caring. Stella led the charge to eliminate PVC from her brand. And at the time, she said there was only one sequin that wasn't using PVC. So she's like, right, we'll just use that one sequin. And then the industry came around and stopped, started making more sequins without PVC. She got the whole caring group to give up PVC. She had the power of and the mass of that corporation behind her. The sequin industry said, uh-oh, and they changed it up. So... You know, there's ways to check in, and then there's also ways to force force through change. Hi. <clears throat> Thank you so much. This has been a fascinating panel. I'm Kathy, and I'm the founder of a company called Third Law, and we help people leverage their wardrobe as a tool for personal and global transformation, so essentially helping them create a more sustainable wardrobe. But my question to you is, what do you think? I want to get as many people on board and create the biggest impact as possible, and I believe that will do that through getting consumers on board. But I'm curious what your thoughts are on the biggest entry point for consumers. My thoughts originally were that it was more about having this great wardrobe and having things you'll love to wear that match and reflect who you are. I think, Brock, you talked about that a little bit. But now I see there is interest in sustainability. So I'm curious what pieces to bring forward. Like, where are you seeing the most interest? Is it about still just having this great wardrobe that you love, or you think people are really interested in creating a sustainable wardrobe at this point? I, I think it's That's a like, good question. you know, not speaking about beauty, but speaking about values. And how do we share our values to create beauty from that? You know, even um, when I'm speaking, um, when I'm in conversations with internal teams, not everyone's on the same page. Um, about like the color or the cut or like what is a wardrobe? but we all align when it comes to values. So for me, personally, it's val using value system as the entry point into opening a conversation and questioning, okay, so if you want this, but you say your value is this, it doesn't align, so maybe we should rethink this part. And then people convert that way. 
you know? But there's definitely a place for mission alignment with our physical self and digital self. And uh, most people style themselves not only for the places they go, but also how they represent themselves through social media and everything else they are doing. But there's not enough message around what goes behind that look uh, from especially sustainability perspective. And it can be used as a different language as well when you're talking about it online. But to go a little deeper, when you're just showcasing yourself to the wider world, especially through digital uh, channels, to be able to add that additional messages. And something that you can definitely help as an organization as you're building their looks to say that what is the tags you can use, the message you can put, to be able to expand the message without losing that interest and excitement around the new look that they have created. Exactly, exactly. And in fact, that's one of the reasons why with, with my book this year, uh, right now, um, I went to Natalie Channon, who I, I profile in the book from Florence, Alabama. She has a company called Alabama Channon. She only uses organic cotton. It's all direct to order. It's made to order. You go online, you buy it, or direct to consumer, you buy it, and then she has a seamstress in Alabama make it for you, sometimes by hand, sometimes by machine, sometimes a bit of both, and then it's sent to you. So there's it's a zero-waste company. And she suggested, we came up with this idea of making organic cotton t-shirts, which we're going to have out here with my books. They're all American made of um, organic cotton, and, and you can just wear them until they fall apart, which is kind of great. And if you do want to get rid of it and you put it in a landfill, we ask you don't. But if you do, it will. Or you want to put it in your compost. You can put it in your compost because it is organic cotton. Um, it's interesting how I think the digital... And like taking the old and the new and melding to them together is how we're going to find the future of fashion. That we have to go back to some of the old ways of doing things pre-industrial revolution, but then we can adopt we can adapt it in the digital age to make it really seamless. <laughs> so I want to thank you all for coming. Oh wait, is there any more questions? Yes. Oh, Fern, of course. Thank you, Dana. Um, I thank you all for everything you're doing and saying because it really is important. And I mean, I believe black, I, I believe sustainable is the new black. And it's the most important thing all of us could be doing. I mean, it's great that we all get paper straws now, but they come in plastic glasses. Yeah. You know, so it's, it's a little bit crazy. Um, but I want to, two things. One, ask you all, what is the one thing that everybody in this room could leave with to do to make a difference. One thing, the first thing, I should say, not the one thing, but the first thing to make a difference. And secondly, um, to everybody in here, Dana's book is extraordinary. She gave Thank it to you. me in Copenhagen, and it is so readable and informative. It is a Bible on this subject. It is so, so good. Uh, since Thank you since the conference, I have pre-sold a ton of them to everybody I've talked to about this. I said, you want to know about it? Go online. It's not ready till September, but pre-order it. it. It really is remarkable. So thank, thank you, you for so doing much. that. So what thank is the one, the one thing everybody could do? If you all have a different one thing. Okay, uh, thanks. <laughs> uh, <laughs> wait. Um, you want me to start? I have, a, I have yes, an answer. Okay. okay. It was the man from Procter & Gamble who told us this. And this is the man who wants us to wash our clothes, right? This is what he does. He sells us stuff to wash our clothes. And he said, wash your clothes less. He said, wash on the short cycle, wash with cold water, and, um, and wash less often. And Chip Berg, you know, CEO of Levi's, he'd like you to not wash your jeans at all, okay? And if you, like, drop something on it, you just get out a toothbrush and spot clean it. Well, that might be a bit extreme. And we all have our moments when we know our jeans could sort of walk out of the house on their own, right? Then you can wash them. But he's right not to want to, you shouldn't wash them every wearing. I mean, that's why mine from the 1980s are still around, because I just wore them until they were ready to be walking out the door on their own. So... Uh, but the short cycle and cold water thing, just super simple. He started rattling off numbers about how much water we, sh we save with the short cycle, how much energy we save with the machine running on the short cycle, and how much energy we save by not heating the water. And it was enormous. Plus, and this is a super big plus, one of the big problems right now is microfibers. We thought fleece was a great great ingenuity, just like we thought polyester was great when it was invented in the 1930s as an alternative to silk 
um, because, you know, when the war effort came and they needed the silk for parachutes and hospitals for thread, you know, we had an alternative. Well, we realized polyester wasn't a great thing, and fleece isn't necessarily a great thing because it releases microfibers when we wash it. And when we wash it, and they get in the rain, they get in the water system. They, last week they said it's raining microfibers in the Rocky Mountains. So you can have an organic garden in Boulder, Colorado, but it's covered in plastic. Heaven help us. So when you wash with warm, if you think about it, it releases more microfibers because you're warming up the fabric and then they sort of escape, right? But cold, short, less microfibers. So you're already changing that up too. It's really simple. And this is the man who wants us to wash our clothes who said to do this. So I said, well, all right. And our clothes last longer if we wash them less and on shorter speeds, shorter times. So just do that. And you've, you've already, if we all just do that, gigantic impact. And maybe to add to that, try to buy products that are not blends with polyester that you have to wash. So outerwear that you may not be washing is safer to have with these blends or polyester that may be needed for water repellency and everything else. But And put it in the sun. Yeah. yeah. And then maybe to add to that one thing that I can say is I know how brands are always obsessed about the consumer feedback. So as consumers in the room always ask the tough questions to, through their online channels, channels and everywhere else because they're going to listen to you as the customer more than anyone else. So the more questions you ask, the more attention they're going to pay it, uh, to fixing their uh, problems. I always say if you want to get something done, you just got to poke people with a stick. So we just got to keep poking at them, right? I actually was going to say the exact yeah. same thing uh, to add to what Brock said. Um, write to them directly. Email uh, their postcards. You can go on to re uh, fashionrevolution.com. They have postcards you can send to your favorite brands or any brands and ask them to change their practices and become more sustainable. And, and the power of the purse. And also just your power as a consumer. Where do you put your money? Buy better. Buy smarter, buy better, buy for longevity. And I, you know, it's hard to say that. <laughs> Being a fashion model is my job to sell you stuff. But it's also my job as doing what I do to try to bring consciousness to what I'm doing and hopefully to my industry because I got to sleep at night <laughs> and, and I also want the world to, you know. To carry on. To carry on, exactly. So uh, we can all do our part by just stopping and thinking a little bit more about our impact. Yeah. Now, um, Philip. Yeah, a <laughs> couple of things. Um, we always ask, you know, I find uh, also from like a, being an entrepreneur, it's tough. We're being squeezed left and right, and we're being questioned, and we're being held up to, um, you know, the flashlight, and we're trying our best. And, um, you know, the best sometimes is not the cheapest thing to do. Um, as we question, why is it so expensive? We should also question, why is it so cheap? Exactly. Um, if it's so expensive, we don't have a choice. You can't afford it anyway, so it's just a complaint. When it's cheap, that's when you have the power to vote because you can actually make that decision. And, and when it's so cheap, think about it for a second. Take a minute for common sense. Someone is paying for your pleasure, and usually it's the people who cannot afford it. Absolutely. That's one thing. The other thing is just start where you are. Um, start small. It's anything you can do. You don't have to become the expert. You just have to be a human being and understand that we cannot no, no longer continue to ignore and just be on autopilot. You know, there's a rule of thumb that if it cost $2, it meant the person who made it was paid two cents. If you think about it that way, you'll change your, your, uh, your approach to shopping. In, it, Clothes have never been so inexpensive. No, They're the same price they were during the Depression. No, and, and I'm telling you from someone who has to do the cost sheets, it does not make sense. The math does not add up. It's impossible. Um, even like reading through her book, which is incredible, I remember there's a passage in there about the um, the woman in Bangladesh that couldn't afford a, she had a toothache. Yes. Oh, and it's she couldn't afford to uh, get dental care, so she had to borrow money, and that uh, in turn led her into um, the sex trade. To pay off the debt for her making tooth. a T-shirt. So think about that. Yeah, yeah definitely. No, it's 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 the choice that you have. Ask the question, why is it so inexpensive? It makes no sense. Better to buy one for 100 yeah. than 10 yeah. 
10 for and 100. I, I work with also 10 for um, 10. Um, vendors who like, we don't work with fast fashion anymore because what they do is they'll come and, you know, they'll, they'll take this, they'll, they'll, can, they'll eat it all up or just cannibalize it. And at the end of the day, we, we have no choice because we're pushed into a, a situation where we have to keep our business going. And in, and in the end, they charge them back. So they destroy them in the end. Destroy them. It's crazy. It's so crazy, guys. So just, I know we can't afford everything, so buy less, make it mean more, hold it on, hold on to it longer, convert it, um, share it, but also question. Question. Thanks for, for the question. Yes. Hi. One over Is in the this on? Hi. Can I ask one question? Um, yes. I had spoken to somebody about uh, burning unused clothes and converting that into energy. Um, apparently, H&M does that. And um, someone was telling me that, and again, I want to know what's folklore or what's real, uh, that, that the, the unused clothes are being burned and energizing a town from where the uh, founders are from. Is that true? Uh. And if so... <laughs> <laughs> like creating like coal energy versus you know with unused clothes. I hadn't heard that one, but you know when I'm done this book tour, maybe I'll put on my jeans and cotton organic cotton T-shirt and trek on up to that town and get out my notebook and find out what's going on. <laughs> I mean, I, I I don't know the the specific situation you're referring to, but in general, there is the practice of uh, incinerating clothes. And it can be also capturing the gases coming out of it, but at the end of the day, it's the worst way of disposing the clothes. And Maybe it's a one lot step of waste. above waste. Uh, it made it them. sound like there was a way to do it that you can actually convert it back into energy. Yeah, right. Don't make as much. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> make less. Yes. Edit what you're making so yeah. that we, as consumers, will buy the best quality products from you. Uh, it just makes sense. Buying less. Or making, creating less. So you I mean, if, if you think about the, um, the process that went into making this outfit, whether it's drilling for the petroleum to make the polyester or growing the cotton and then, then milling it and then spinning it and then weaving it and then dyeing it and then selling it and then cutting it and then designing and then doing samples and then producing those samples and then getting them to the stores and then buying the and then putting them in the stores and then they don't sell and then they get marked down and then they get marked down and then they get marked down and then they wind up in Sweden to, fun, to, to heat someone's house? No, come on. <laughs> The beauty of sustainability and the beauty of all this good works that we're, we're pushing here is that it brings back the sense of community. And in the digital age, we'd lost that because we're so busy being in our bubble on our screens. And we've also had lost the, the, the desire or just the habit, just plainly the habit of making things with our hands. And these things are coming back into play after 20 or 30 years of screen, 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 tap, 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 type, 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 type. type scroll scroll and there's sewing bees they're knitting circles there's I, I ran into a woman on the jitney to shelter island who was carrying a spinning wheel <laughs> and she was going out to spin her own spend the weekend spinning her wool to knit her sweater and she's going to dye it with the two indigo plants she has in her kitchen garden now she sounds like crunchy granola hippie girl right <laughs> she works in finance I was like oh this is good this is, this is hope. This gives us hope, right? That we just want to get back to making things again and, and, and swapping and sharing and community and stories. That's also the beauty of making things in the knitting circles that we share the stories and we share the tips, the hints from Heloise. All of this will help make everything better. That's why slowing down in fashion slowing down. Is, is becoming more mindful, becoming more creative again, I think. Our industry needs a makeover. We're never going to get rid of fast fashion, just like you know we didn't get rid of fast food. But when Fast Food Nation came out 20 years ago, the organic 
food was ex super expensive and there was no there were no farmers markets in big cities or hardly any and there were no you know farm to table was a fancy schmancy thing there was one in washington dc and it's where the clintons went okay so uh when they were presidents you know president and first lady so you know what happened was the rise of organic and the, the democratization of the good stuff to make it more available to more people. And now we have Whole Foods, which is owned by Amazon. That's about as democratic as you can get, right? We may not like Amazon, but I like the idea that it's not precious anymore, that organic food isn't a premium. And I think we can do the same with sustainable clothing and fashion. That we won't get rid of the fast the H and M's and the Zara's, but look, Forever Twenty One might disappear, and meanwhile, we have Philip Lim, <laughs> and we have Fern with another question. I, I just want to add add one more thing. The other issue that doesn't get addressed as often is the shipping and the packaging of everything, and the amount of stuff everybody's ordering online, the amount of trucks on the street that are leaving hundreds and hundreds of boxes every day at every building. And when you order something on Amazon, if you order three things, they send it in three different boxes oh. in three different days. I mean, how, how can we somewhat change that? Because that's a huge part of this problem. Amber, there's your next project. Well, I mean, I think it is, again, it is about slowing down. And it is about asking these companies, you know, Jeff, we're talking to you. Um, to to do things the right way and make packaging that's that is biodegradable. I mean, yes, cardboard is, but do we need three cardboard boxes for three different books? No. Um, and also the experience of like you know you were talking about the woman that was had the making her own yarn um, or the shopping experience being online. It's it's trying to take things. And, and, and slow them down and have a more human experience. So it means from creating to buying to enjoying it to slow down to have a human experience instead of just more of this like, we're, we're so unconscious at the moment and why? I think that's the question is why are we tuned out? Let's tune in and really enjoy what's happening in our world today and make it better. Yeah. It's like why is all this Definitely. stuff coming at us? There's a reason. Guys, there's a reason. It's Absolutely. usually us. We're the reasons. Yes. We have to stop expecting next day, same day, yes. blah, blah, blah. I, I walk to work every day, and I see the Amazon Prime delivery hubs, and it's a tr like frightening, 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 frightening. I see it every day. I take videos every day, and it's like <laughs> more and more frightening. You know, um, and we have the power. It's like what you said. It's like if you, if you don't vote for it, it won't exist anymore. Yeah but you keep voting for it. And you know what I find too when now I'm okay not receiving it the next day and it actually now comes back to I treat people with more patience because I don't demand because what happened is in the way you consume, you think you, that's how you should treat people also. Why not? Right away, immediately, immediately, immediately. Instead of like if you kind of change your consuming behavior, it translates on how you actually, um, your relationships. Absolutely. Any more questions? Oh my goodness! One, one. Hey, I'm getting hello. told one last one. Okay, yeah. way in the back. Guys, great conversation. Thanks for having this. And I found Ivan's question particularly fascinating about um, burning merchandise. So I did a quick Google search, and by no means I don't <laughs> think this is <clears throat> on par with anything. But I found a few articles, and there are a number of different companies: H and M, Urban. Nike, Burberry, um, I'm sure amongst many, it seems like, that are destroying Oh, they do destroy, and, for sure. And, and, and burning, particularly. And these are big numbers, but out of 3.6 billion um, in, in revenue, Burberry destroyed 36 million of its own merchandise. And this was from last year, September 2018. Um, I'm sure there's more to dive into, and I'm, you know, not exactly sure what the particulars are because we a quick make a hundred million items a year in gar garments, yeah. and we only buy eighty. But that that was worth. So there's back twenty into the there are, or billion. Sorry, billion, billion. billion we make a, we make a hundred billion, and eighty billion are purchased. So that leaves twenty billion to go where? Up in smoke. How much 
because that ends up in landfill every or landfill. year. And then, and then of that 80, how much lands up in landfill? Exactly. 99% uh, in the end. 1% is recycled. We got to change that. Thank you so much for coming out. <laughs>